I was hyped for the announcement of Star Wars Squadrons, even more hyped than the announcement of Star Wars Jedi or the previous Battlefront games. I've always adored the sci-fi aspects of Star Wars, the huge battle cruisers, the iconic starfighters, and of course, the epic space battles. So I thought this as good a time as any to revisit the games that have led up the Squadrons. I'm not going to go through every Star Wars game that include a X-Wing or a TIE Fighter in it, but I am going to go through the history of space combat games and the Star Wars franchise that will give you a sense of how we got to Squadrons. The very first video game in the Star Wars franchise was The Empire Strikes Back, released in 1982 for the Atari 2600 and developed by Parker Brothers. Players flew a snow speeder against AT-ATs in the iconic Battle of Hoth. Now it's not much to look at these days of course, but it was rather impressive by the standards of 1982. Now, serious Star Wars nerds might note that 1982 release date seems a bit odd. The Empire Strikes Back was released in 1980, so this game was rather late. As it turns out, Parker Brothers' rights to make Star Wars video games came through a really broad interpretation of the exclusive toy licensing deal Lucasfilm had struck with Kenner Products, which is a sister company of Parker Brothers, all the way back in 1977. The game arrived a bit late because frankly Parker Brothers didn't know what they had. Still, it was received well overall with Electronic Games calling it an auspicious debut. Joystick Magazine was a bit less kind giving it 2 stars and calling the game little more than a weak Defender variant. The game did sell very well and it went on the rank among the best selling Atari games of 1982. Parker Brothers acted more quickly in 1983 with Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle which released right alongside the film. It essentially repeated the basic formula of the Empire Strikes Back game with players this time piloting the Millennium Falcon around the screen, battling TIE fighters and trying to destroy the Death Star. That said, it was a little more complex with two phases to the gameplay that added some extra depth. <laughs> Like its predecessor, Death Star Battle received mostly, but not overwhelmingly positive press, and it did sell really well throughout 1983. Also released in 1983 was the first Star Wars arcade game. Now, it was developed by Atari because the exclusivity claim that gave Parker Brothers rights to all the Star Wars games was starting to break down, and the game repurposed the underpinnings of Atari's famous Battle Zone to create a first person dogfighting game that ended with the famous trench run scene from Star Wars A New Hope. Red 5, I'm going in. This game was a real spectacle in 1983, and I think it even has some charm today. As you might expect, it sold well, moving over 12,500 arcade cabinets. It would later come to home computers with versions for MS-DOS, Amiga, and Commodore 64, among others. I played quite a few rounds of this arcade game in the mid-90s, and while it was visually dated compared to the newer machines, I still really liked it. The graphics, the music, and the cool yoke-style control came together in a thoroughly authentic Star Wars experience. Atari followed up on the success of Star Wars arcade debut with two more arcade games, The Return of the Jedi and The Empire Strikes Back. The first of these was a big departure using an isometric perspective and 2D graphics, while The Empire Strikes Back cabinet was very similar to the first Star Wars arcade, and in fact, it was sold as an upgrade kit for it. I've not been able to find hard numbers on how well these games sold, but according to desirability rankings from the Vintage Arcade Preservation Society, they're not nearly as popular among collectors today as the original. Also released in 1985 was a game that technically isn't really a Star Wars game, but also kind of is. Death Star Interceptor for the ZX Spectrum. The game clearly rips off iconic Star Wars designs, including the X-Wing and of course the Death Star, uh, but it's not a Star Wars game and it never really claims to be. The rather hilarious ad copy reads, Earth is threatened by an Imperial Death Star, and the cover art even shows the Death Star on approach to our home planet. Yeah, it's pretty weird, and as if that wasn't weird enough, the game does include the Star Wars main theme in it, and it even claims to officially license it, uh, which seems very strange considering the rest of the game isn't licensed. And I suspect there is a lot more to this story, so let me know if you think it's worth digging into. In any case, it was a middle-of-the-road starfighter game for its day, and actually, it was the last dogfighting game in the Star Wars universe until the early 90s. 
Star Wars games took a bit of a break in the late 1980s, with a few exceptions like the platformers that came to the Nintendo and Super Nintendo system. Apparently there's a mandate from Lucasfilm that the company couldn't develop games internally because they could always just license the games to other companies, so they take the risk in making the game. That's why LucasArts, which was really active in game development, throughout the 1980s, never ended up making any Star Wars games that go alongside the original trilogy. LucasArts changed strategy with a game that became an all-time legend. Yep, I'm talking about X-Wing. Developed by Totally Games, but published by LucasArts and Disney Interactive, X-Wing shipped in February 1993 for MS-DOS. It followed a simple but winning formula, putting a Star Wars spin on the space combat genre popularized by the Wing Commander series. But this was way more than a clone of a successful concept with Star Wars skin slapped on it. X-Wing shipped with a long list of missions, impressive graphics, and snappy controls. It also had a cool music system called iMuse that switched between various familiar Star Wars themes and some new tracks, depending on what happened during a mission. The legacy of the series was cemented with the 1994 follow-up, TIE Fighter, which boosted the original's already excellent graphics and delivered another long, enjoyable single-player campaign. Oh, and you got to fly a TIE Fighter, which was kind of a big deal in 1994. TIE Fighter hauled in a bunch of Game of the Year awards and has become a really enduring classic in the space combat genre and is widely considered one of the best Star Wars video games of all time. Two more X-Wing games followed. 1997's X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter put a multiplayer spin on the series and significantly upgraded the graphics to keep pace with the times. That was followed by X-Wing Alliance, which added multi-crew craft like the Millennium Falcon, a mission builder, and supported much larger battles. Unfortunately, these enhancements weren't quite enough to keep the series alive. Both games were good, even great depending on who you ask, but the PC games market was now enamored with first-person shooters, and neither of these games made it console. Even the once dominant franchises in this space, like Wing Commander and the space combat offshoot of Decent, Free Space, they were falling out of favor. An alternative take on space combat came to both console and PC in November of 1993, called Star Wars Rebel Assault. It was a rail shooter focusing on a quick trigger finger to blast foes out of the sky. The game was notable for its extensive use of pre-rendered full motion video sequences that delivered impressive visuals. I mean, take a look at this. That was really cutting edge stuff for 1993, and it clearly exceeded the kind of graphics that you could expect from a fully 3D rendered game. Unlike the widely praised X-Wing series, Rebel Assault received mediocre to downright bad reviews, with critics panning the restrictive rail shooter gameplay. Still, it sold quite well, and a sequel called Star Wars Rebel Assault 2 The Hidden Empire released in November of 1995. It followed the same formula, delivered even more impressive visuals, and it even came to the PlayStation. Still, the Rebel Assault series didn't end up moving forward. Like space combat games on the PC, the market for FMV games was vanishing with players flocking toward fully 3D games instead. LucasArts put a bet on this trend with 1998's Rogue Squadron, a game developed in partnership with Factor 5 that came exclusively to Nintendo's N64. It put players in the seat of an X-Wing, A-Wing, Y-Wing, and other craft, but moved combat planet side, for the most part, and adopted arcade-style combat, giving a chance to showcase impressive 3D environments that looked particularly sharp if played on an N64 with an expansion pack. That bumped the game's resolution from 320x240 to 640 x 480 Released just as the re-release of the original Star Wars trilogy hit theaters, Rogue Squadron was a major success and widely praised by critics. Rogue Squadron was followed by two sequels, 2001's Rogue Leader and 2003's Rebel Strike, both released as Nintendo GameCube exclusives. Rogue Leader was extremely successful and critically considered the best of the series, winning E3 2001's Game Critics Award for Best Action Game. It delivered larger battles and even took combat back out of the atmosphere for a climatic recreation of the Battle of Endor. 
Rebel Strike, on the other hand, was a minor disappointment, though it still received mixed reviews. It tried the mixing ground combat for the first time, but critics didn't think it meshed well with the franchise's strong arcade-style dogfighting. That unfortunately ended the Rogue Squadron franchise. Factor 5 would end up developing a new game in the series, Rogue Squadron, Rogue Leaders Wii, for Nintendo's massively successful console, but it was never released due to financial issues surrounding the 2008 financial crisis. There's one other game worth mentioning alongside Rogue Squadron, and that's Star Wars Episode I Battle for Naboo. Developed by Factor 5 and released for the N64 as well as PC, Battle for Naboo was essentially a Rogue Squadron game by another name, and it was released to capitalize on the success of the Star Wars prequels. While the PC port wasn't well received due to poor controls and lackluster graphics compared to other PC titles, the N64 version received mixed to positive reviews and it's worth checking out if you like the other Rogue Squadron games. The Rogue Squadron series wasn't your only option if you wanted to become a pilot in the Star Wars universe in the early aughts. LucasArts developed its own game, Star Wars Starfighter, which released in February of 2001 for PC, Xbox, and PlayStation 2. A sequel, Jedi Starfighter, was released just one year later in 2002. For a little target practice. My energy bomb should knock these baby shields down in no time. You don't hear much about these games today, and I think that has a lot to do with their setting. While Rogue Squadron revisits classic scenarios from the original trilogy, Starfighter focuses on the less beloved prequels. Still, the games were quite favorably reviewed at the time, earning scores of 84 and 81 on Metacritic. They also sold well, with Starfighter moving over 1.75 million copies and Jedi Starfighter moving almost a million, according to figures from VG charts. And after Jedi Starfighter, there was, well, not much. Star Wars games continued to be made, but space combat really fell out of favor. The industry's gravity had shifted towards first-person and third-person action games like the Force Unleashed games, as well as, of course, Bioware's famous Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic RPG. Now, that's not to say space combat was completely absent from all Star Wars games. Bioware's Star Wars MMO, The Old Republic, included some pretty predominant star fighting sections that were interspersed throughout the story as players leveled up. There also were really early mobile games like Battle of Coruscant, which tried to bring space combat to a new mobile arena. But for the most part, star fighters just weren't the focus anymore, leaving fans eager to pilot at X-Wing, no choice but to just go and replay the classics. The first hint that might change came with an add-on mission to 2016 Star Wars Battlefront called Rogue One X-Wing VR Mission. Exclusive to PlayStation VR, the one-off teased the possibility of a Star Wars space combat game played on modern hardware. Then came Star Wars Battlefront 2, which included some short space combat missions alongside a multiplayer Starfighter assault mode. It's easy to see how these small excursions back into dogfighting led to squadrons. Both the previous VR mission and Starfighter Assault were well received by critics and players, which no doubt helped make the case for a full game based on the idea. But it's also clear Electronic Arts is still hedging its bets a bit here as squadrons will sell for just $40 and is expected to include less content than the previous Battlefront games. What comes after that? I think it has everything to do with how well Squadrons is received. But if players skip over it, EA will likely conclude that the space combat games still aren't suited for high budget development, and I doubt we'll see another similar game for years. That said, EA's rights to Star Wars video games end in 2023, so if EA doesn't reach a deal to renew those rights, game development would fall to another publisher, and all bets are off. Personally, I hope Squadrons is a massive hit worthy of the Star Wars franchise. I'd love to see more dogfighting and space combat games in the Star Wars universe. But what about you? Let me know what you hope for in the future of Star Wars video games. And of course, if you liked this video, give it a like. If you loved it, go ahead and subscribe. Let me know too what you would like me to cover in future videos. I'm always up for ideas. Thanks for watching and see you next time.